It's okay, Sam. <laughs> Hello, everybody. We are live. Oh, my goodness. It is hot here already. And I'm breaking out in hives because of the heat. So we've we've figured out one mystery. It is Ooh. hot here already. And I've already screwed up. I'm breaking out in hives because of the heat. So we've, we've figured out one mystery. Ooh. And I've already screwed up. There we go. Boomer moment. Okay, we're back. <laughs> um, so I'm probably going to have to get my hair cut short because there's no way I'm going to get through this summer and this heat with long hair. Um, I love my long hair, but it's going to have to go. Going to have to go. So anyway, welcome, welcome to everyone. Uh, we are on... Page 170 and 171. Um, let me, I did not check the last video to see where we were. All right, so we'll just start on page 170 and we'll um, do the, the reading from there. Hello, Shaman. Hello, Survival. Uh, they both say hello to you. So if you want to wave for everyone, yay, there's Mary Lou. <laughs> We've had a wonderful day together. So, hey, Shell's here too, and she says hi. And um, yeah, yeah, it's going to be, we're, we're, we're figuring stuff out. And next week I go for my ketamine, so I don't know if I'm going to do a show on Thursday. But I do know that I'm going to do a Saturday show. Uh, just to let you guys know. Um, so, oh, cool. Okay, Kevin Edwards is here. Or, Oki, Kevin Edwards is here. How do you get lucky today to make it? Oh, you're lucky today to make it. So, I'm glad you're here. Glad you're here. But, um, yeah, I've done, life has just been a roller coaster um, recently. I was uh, in the hospital last night for a three-day migraine um, you know, when it gets to day three, that's when it starts to get scary. That's when it officially becomes what's known as status migranosis. Um, you know, and I've, I'd been in status migranosis before that had lasted years. So really wanted to nip that in the bud. And I'm very glad, very glad that I live in a small town, um, because the emergency room, there's nobody in it waiting. <laughs> it was just me. <laughs> so that was fantastic. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I'm, I am feeling better. Thank you very much. Um, and then next week, hopefully, you know, the ketamine treatment will serve me even better there. So yeah, things are, it's been rough recently, but things will get better. Things will definitely get better. So, um, yeah, everything's arranged. My neighbor's going to take me in. And I have everything that I need for the um, what do you call it procedure. So yeah, yeah, it'll be good. It'll be good. So I'm glad everybody's here. Yay! <laughs> All right. Um. So we are talking about uh, Abraham and Isaac, uh, and how the, the sacrifice. Um, oh, thank you, Sean. I appreciate it. So, and, oh, I wanted to tell you guys, Lawrence is not going to be here tonight. Unfortunately, his, his uh, router is broken, uh, but his brother and sister are going to buy him a new one, um, but he has been without internet, and that is why. Uh, but he will rejoin us soon. So that will be a glorious thing. I can move this a little bit closer and more to the center. There we go. All right. So, yeah. Yeah, talking about um, Abraham and Isaac. And if you'll remember the story, uh, Abraham, they weren't supposed to be able to have a child because they were way too old. Um, and God said, no, you will be the blessed with a child and you will be the father of nations. Um, and so when God then asks 
uh, Abraham to sacrifice his son. It's like, here, you've got to sacrifice your biggest dream. You know, that you're this child that you wanted, that I promised you, that I gave you, you now have to sacrifice for me. And this only happens once uh, in the Bible, um, except for, of course, the sacrifice of Jesus, you know, which is God's only son. And so these, these two stories parallel one another. Um, and it, I, uh, at the last minute, you know, an angel comes and, and stays Abraham's hand and says, nope, you don't have to do this. Go look in the thicket. There's a ram. And it's a beautiful story because Isaac doesn't fight back. You know, Isaac is just as uh, willing to be the sacrifice to God as Abraham is willing to sacrifice him to God. And it's almost like a ritual, a magic moment of, of giving up of everything to God by both parties. And as a result, you know, the miracle happens and the ram appears stuck in the thicket and they can use that as the sacrifice instead. So starting on page 170, um, I'll, I'll start at the end of the, the previous Paragraph, why does he, why does life impose such demands? We'll start our analysis with a truism, stark, self-evident, and understated. Sometimes things do not go well. That seems to have much to do with the terrible nature of the world, with its plagues and famines and tyrannies and betrayals. But here's the, the rub. Sometimes when things are not going well, it's not the world that's the cause. The cause is instead that which is currently most valued subjectively and personally. Why? Because the world is revealed to an indeterminate degree through the template of your values. Much more on this in Rule 10. If the world you are seeing is not the world you want, therefore, it's time to examine your values. It's time to rid yourself of your current presuppositions. It's time to let go. It might even be time to sacrifice what you love best so that you can become who you might become instead of staying who you are. There's an old and possibly apocryphal story about how to catch a monkey that illustrates this set of ideas very well. First, you must find yourself a large, narrow-necked jar, just barely wide enough in diameter at the top for the monkey to put its hands in, hand inside. Then you must fill the jar partway with rocks so that it is too heavy for the monkey to carry. Then you must scatter some treats attractive to monkeys near the jar to attract one and put some more inside the jar. A monkey will come along, reach into the narrow opening and grab while the grabbing is good. But now he won't be able to extract his fist all full of treats. You know, you can stick your hand in, can't get it out. The, from the too narrow opening of the jar, not without unclenching its hands. Not, uh, and that's just what he won't do. The monkey catcher can then just walk over to the jar and pick up the monkey. The animal will not sacrifice the part to preserve the whole. Sometimes something valuable given up ensures future prosperity. Something valuable sacrificed pleases the Lord what is most valuable and best sacrificed, or what is at least emblematic of that? A choice cut of meat, the best animal in the flock, a most valued possession. What's above even that? Something intensely personal and painful to give up. That's symbolized perhaps in God's insistence on circumcision as part of Abraham's sacrificial routine where the part is offered symbolically to redeem the whole. What's beyond that? What pertains more closely to the whole person rather than the part? What constitutes the ultimate sacrifice for the gain of the ultimate prize? This is also echoed in the uh, Cain and Abel. Uh, yeah, you're absolutely right. People trap raccoons like that too. Yep. I was thinking about that as I read it. Um, yeah, you know, K 
Cain did not make his best sacrifice. Abel did. And therefore, you know, God smiled upon Abel and not on Cain. And Cain didn't understand because he thought he was offering his best. No, he was just offering what was routine and expected. It, it wasn't, you know, what he cherished most. It was just what he had worked hard for. Big difference. Big difference. So it's a close race between child and self. The sacrifice of the mother offering her child to the world is exemplified profoundly by Michelangelo's great sculpture, the Pieta, illustrated at the beginning of this chapter. Michelangelo crafted Mary contemplating her son crucified and ruined. It's her fault. It was through her that he entered into the world and its great drama of being. Is it right to bring a baby into this terrible world? Every woman asks herself that question. Some say no, and they have their reasons. Mary answers yes, voluntarily, knowing full well what's to come, as do all mothers. If they allow themselves to see, it's an act of supreme courage when undertaken voluntarily. Hell, and that says a lot about what's going on with people that aren't having children. You know, it's not just a personal sacrifice of your time, your lifestyle and things like that. It's an act of courage to know, you know, yes, this is a terrible world, but I have faith. Yes, this child may end up broken and, and destroyed by the world, but I'm going to have the courage to voluntarily bring forth a life. And that kind of courage is missing from the younger generations. Um, you know, anybody who has kids will know that, you know, there, there's huge sacrifices in having children. Um, and it's, it's one of those things where it's like, you don't just sacrifice the material stuff. You don't just sacrifice your time. You, you sacrifice your heart because your heart is going to be broken watching that child grow up and depending on what happens to them. I mean, that's, that's one of the things that Jordan Peterson talks about in Rule 12 is, you know, the, he's dealing with the, the suffering of his daughter and not being able to do anything for her um, and her being on crutches so long and at such a young age because of juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. I mean, your heart is going to break when you have children and the courage to say, I will let my heart be broken because it is a far, far better thing for me to make a family than it is for my heart to remain unscathed. You know what I'm saying? Um, and, oh man, that made me tear up. <laughs> so I just want to say, you know, a big round of applause to all parents out there. Um, that, you know, you, you don't know fear until you have a child. And suddenly it's, it's not about you. It's about this life and you've got to protect it. And that it's terrifying. It's terrifying having a child. <laughs> Because you can't save them from everything. And to a certain extent, you don't want to. You know, it's not a good idea, which he'll talk about in rule. Can't remember if it's 11 or what, but it's don't bother children while they're skateboarding. Um, you know, they need some fear. They need some danger. They need that to gain competency. Um, so, yeah, it's... Uh, it, that's why it's so life altering, you know, to have a child and it continues to be life altering as that child grows up and moves through the world. Um, so, yeah, and it's it's the ultimate courage, the ultimate courage to do that, to say, you know, I'm going to be responsible for another human being. hundred percent. It falls on nobody else's shoulders but mine. Once you become a parent, even if you abandon that child, you're still a parent. Isn't that interesting? All right. 
So in turn, Mary's son, Christ, offers himself to God in the world to betrayal, torture, and death to the very point of despair on the cross where he cries out those terrible words, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Matthew 27, 46. This is the archetypical, archetypical story of the man who gives his all for the sake of the better, who offers up his life for the advancement of being, who allows God's will to become manifest fully within the confines of a single mortal life. That is the model for an honorable man. In Christ's case, however, as he sacrifices himself, God, his father, is simultaneously sacrificing his son, capital H-I-S. Oh, and that's the other, hey, Latin Patriot, welcome. I haven't seen you in here before. I don't know if you've been lurking, but, you know, glad to have you. Um, I don't know if it's a different name. There may be a different screen name. I don't know. But anyway, welcome. Um, that's the other thing is, is that Jesus doesn't speak up in defense of him. Well, depending on which but book of the Bible you read, either he has a huge conversation with Pontius Pilate um, or he says nothing uh, like he does in Matthew. Uh, and, you know, the, the, the crowd is given a choice. Do you want to save Jesus, you know, your, your savior, your, this man that you have put up, you know, as, as your holy leader, um, fulfillment of prophecy, all of that, or are you going to sacrifice, uh, or are you going to choose to save the life of this known murderer, you know, who's a rabble rouser and everything else? Um, I can't remember his name, but if, if Greg Kelly were here, he would know. <laughs> so, and it's interesting that we're doing this, you know, Palm Sunday's coming up. Um, so, yeah, it'll be, it's... Um, Interesting coincidence. So, hey, Samantha P is in the house. Um, oh, you didn't have notifications on. No worry, Latin. No worry. So, all right. Where was I? Sacrifices his son. It is for this reason that the Christian sacrificial drama of son and self is archetypical. It's a story at the limit where nothing more extreme nothing greater can be imagined that's the very definition of archetypical that's the very core of what constitutes religious uh kind of like the the captain going down with the the ship sort of thing so um pain and suffering define the world of that there can be no doubt sacrifice can hold pain and suffering in abeyance to a greater or lesser degree and the greater the sacrifices that can do that more effectively than the lesser. Of that, there can be no doubt. Everyone holds this knowledge in their soul. Thus, the person who wishes to alleviate suffering, who wishes to rectify the flaws in being, who wants to bring about the best of all possible futures, who wants to create heaven on earth, will make the greatest sacrifices of self, of child, of everything that is loved, to live a life aimed at the good. He will forgo expedience. He will pursue the path of ultimate meaning. And he will, in that matter, bring salvation to the ever desperate world. Isn't that amazing? So, but is such a thing even possible? Is this simply not asking too much of the individual? It's all well and good for Christ. It may be objected, but he was the veritable son of God. But we do have other examples, some le much less mythologi mythologized and archetypical. Consider, for example, the case of Socrates, the ancient Greek philosopher. After a lifetime of seeking the truth and educating his countrymen, Socrates faced a trial for crimes against the city-state of Athens, his hometown. His accusers provided him with plenty of opportunity simply to leave and avoid the whole trouble. But the great sage had already considered this and rejected this course of action. His companion Hermogenes observed him at this time discussing any and every subject other than his trial and asked him why he appeared so unconcerned. Socrates first answered that he had been preparing his whole life to, fit, to defend himself 
but then said something more mysterious and significant. When he attempted to specifically consider the strategies that would produce acquittal by means fair or foul, or even merely considered his potential actions at the trial, he found himself interrupted by his divine sign, his internal spirit, voice, or daemon. Socrates discussed this voice at the trial itself. He said that one of the factors distinguishing him from other men was his absolute willingness to listen to its warnings, to stop speaking, and to cease acting when it objected. All right, I got to ask you guys, have you run into this little voice? I have. And every time I haven't listened to it, it's, it's kind of like an intuition and you don't know where it's coming from. And um, it's just this, this thought, don't say this, don't do that. You know, it's, it's very, it's a voice of very little words. <laughs> um, and uh yeah, and, and when I follow it, good things happen. And when I don't follow it, bad things happen. And I'm trying to get better, like Socrates, at just obeying it at all times. And it's it's hard. It's really hard. It's really, really hard. Um, so Shell says yes. Um, anybody else recognize that voice? Um, what type of dog are you? I don't understand that question. Um, so yeah, just this internal conscience. Um, I don't know what else to call it, but um, yeah, I'm, I'm glad, Shell, that you and I connect on that. <laughs> um, so he goes on to say, the gods themselves had deemed him wise above other men, not for this reason, not least for this reason, according to the Delphic Oracle herself, held to be a reliable judge of such things. Because his ever reliable internal voice, and that's the problem, is I don't know that that voice, I don't trust that voice necessarily. So uh, survival says, yeah, I recognize the small voice. Uh, Samantha P says, absolutely. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's, and, and isn't it odd that we all, have that, you know, I, I don't know of a person who doesn't, I mean, maybe they don't listen, maybe they, you know, cut off their hearing from it, but that doesn't mean that it, that it's not there. Um, and so that it's, I, I want, I want there to be neurological studies on that to figure out where does that come from? You know, because it's a, it's a knowing beyond knowing, um, and how does that even happen? You know, is, is that the left brain? Is that the gut thinking? You know, wh where does that come from? Um, because it's just, it's just too cool. It's too fascinating. So, because his ever reliable internal voice objected to fleeing or even defending himself, Socrates radically altered his view of the significance of his trial. He began to consider that it might be a blessing rather than a curse. He told Hermogenes of his realization that the spirit to whom he had always listened might be offering him a way out of life in a manner, quote, easiest, but also the least irksome to one's friends with, quote, sound body and a spirit capable of showing kindness. Oh. Wow. Um, a sound body, mind, capable of showing kindness. Isn't that incredible? Um, and absent the, quote, throes of illness and vexations of extreme old age, Socrates' decision to accept his fate allowed him to put away mortal terror in the face of death itself prior to and during the trial and after the sentence was handed down and even later during his execution. He saw that his life had been so rich and full that he could let it go gracefully. 
Have you guys seen that T-shirt, you know, with the cat on the front? It's clawing down the front of the shirt, and it says, anything that I've let go of has claw marks all over it. That's what most people do is they, they, they grasp. They try to continue to hold on to, um, and it, it can ruin everything about it. Um, so, yeah, to, to be able to let go of one's own life, life gracefully um, my stepdad did that when he died. Uh, he died of, of cancer. Um, and he, you know, he was leaving my mother behind. He was leaving behind his mother um, and all sorts of, uh, you know, other family, things like that. But he said that uh, life was complete. Um, I think she may be, and that's okay. Uh, we were both napping earlier today, so, um, but she may just be listening. So, oh, she's just listening. <laughs> there we go. Um, so he was given the opportunity to put his affairs in order. He saw that he could escape the terrible, slow degeneration of advancing years. He came to understand all that was happening to him as a gift from the gods. And that was the other thing is that, you know, my stepfather was a man of great faith. And so when he died, um, he said, I have lived a full life. You know, he, he had done everything that he wanted to do. Um, even though the boat was unfinished in the basement, you know, but that was, that was that's a small thing to give up. Um, so, yeah. To give up life gracefully and to die gracefully and not make it a horrible situation for friends and family around him, you know, just to be able to say, look, it's, it's all good, man. I know you're going to miss me, but it's all okay. It's been enough. Um, and that's just that. I'm going to cry again. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I am. <laughs> Okay, there we go. Um, put the link to that quiz you guys are taking for the dog type in the comments. I want I want to play it later. So, um, he was not therefore required to defend himself against his accusers, at least not with the aim of pronouncing his innocence and escaping his fate. Instead, he turned the table, addressing his judges in a manner that makes the reader understand precisely why the town council wanted this man dead. Then he took the poison like a man. Uh, Socrates rejected expedients and the, necessary, the necessity for manipulation that accompanied it. He chose instead under the direct, under the direst of conditions to maintain his pursuit of the meaningful and true. 2,500 years later, we remember his decision and take comfort from it. What can we learn from this? If you cease to utter falsehoods and live according to the dictates of your conscience, you can maintain your nobility, even when fit facing the ultimate threat. If you abide truthfully and courageously by the highest of ideals, you will be provided with more security and strength than will be offered by any short-sighted concentration on your own safety. If you live properly, fully, you can discover meaning so profound that it protects you from even the fear of death. Could all of this possibly be true? Good question. Um... Oh, 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 oh. Okay, got it, got it, got it, got it. Thank you for clearing that up. <laughs> yeah, I know that Shaman's uh, picture is a dog. I always thought it was a doxy with a hood. <laughs> but if it's, uh, what is it? Miniature Pincher. They're, they're another good dog. Good hunting dog. So, um 
Death, Toil, and Evil. Well, this will be a simple chapter. <laughs> the tragedy of self-conscious being produces suffering, inevitable suffering. That suffering turns, in turn motivates the desire for selfish, immediate gratification, for expedience. But sacrifice and work serves far more effectively than short-term impulsive pleasure at keeping suffering at bay. However, tragedy itself, conceived of as the arbitrary harshness of the society and nature set against the vulnerability of the individual, is not the only and perhaps not even the primary source of suffering. There is also the problem of evil to consider. The world is set hard against us of a certainty, but a man's inhumanity, but man's inhumanity to man is something even worse. Thus, the problem of sacrifice is compounded in its complexity. It is not only privation and mortal limitation that must be addressed by work, by the willingness to offer and give up. It's the problem of evil as well. Consider again, once again, the story of Adam and Eve. Life becomes very hard for their children. That's us. After the fall and the awakening of our archetypical parents. First is the terrible fate awaiting for us in the post-paradisal world, in the world of history. Not the least of this is what Goethe called our creative endless toil. Humans work as we have seen. We work because we have been awakened to the truth of our own vulnerability, our subjugation to disease and death, and wish to protect ourselves for as long as possible. Once we can see the future, we must prepare for it or live in denial and terror. We therefore sacrifice the pleasures of today for the sake of a better tomorrow. But the realization of mortality and the necessity of work is not the only revelation to Adam and Eve when they eat the forbidden fruit, wake up, and open their eyes. They were also granted, or cursed by, the knowledge of good and evil. Oh, my things aren't... Here we are. It took me decades to understand what this means, to understand even part of what that means. It's this. Once you become consciously aware that you yourself are vulnerable, you understand the nature of human vulnerability in general. You understand what it's like to be fearful and angry and resentful and bitter. You understand what pain means. And once you truly understand such feelings in yourself, and how they're produced, you understand how to produce them in others. It is in this manner that the self-conscious beings that we are become voluntarily and exquisitely that, let me start that over. In this manner that the self-conscious being that we are become voluntarily and exquisitely capable of tormenting others and ourselves, of course, but see other, others we are concerned about right now. We see the consequences of this new knowledge manifest themselves when we meet Cain and Abel, the son of Adam and Eve. By the time of their appearance, mankind has learned to make sacrifices to God on altars of stone designed for that purpose. A communal ritual is performed, the immolation of something valuable, a choice animal or a portion thereof, and its transformation through fire to the smoke to the spirit that rises to heaven above. In this manner, the idea of delay is dramatized so that the future might improve. Abel's sacrifices are accepted by God and he flourishes. Cain's, however, are rejected. He becomes jealous and bitter, and it's no wonder. If someone fails and is rejected because he refused to make any sacrifices at all, well, that's at least understandable. He may still feel resentful and vengeful, but he knows in his heart that he is the person to blame. The knowledge generally places a limit on his outrage. It's much worse, however, if he actually, if he had actually foregone the pleasures of the moment, if he had strived and toiled and things still didn't work out, if he was rejected despite his efforts, then he's lost the present and the future. Then his work his sacrifice has been pointless. Under such condition, the world darkens and the soul rebels. This is why stalkers can be so dangerous, is they, they see themselves as, as sacrificing 
you know, so much for this other person to show them their love or whatever like that. And when you get rejected by that, whoa, dark monsters appear. So um, Samantha says, dying gracefully to me means more than the emotional state, making sure my family is not financially devastated. Yes, uh, my stepdad did that. Uh, the last thing I want during their mourning is they're raising money, trying to bury me, et cetera. Yeah. Well, that's the thing is that the cancer, um, he got the cancer diagnosis uh, early on. And so they were able to travel and, you know, do all these wonderful things and, you know, set all of his affairs in order and everything like that. They had time before he eventually died. And he knew that my mother would be taken care of and that his family would be taken care of and all of that. So, yes. Um, you're, you're absolutely right in that regard, Samantha. And that, and, you know, Socrates even talks about it, being able to set your affairs in order and then not leave any burdens for the family. Um, survival says, uh, that's part of growing up. Um, and it, it is in a way, a part of growing up, being responsible, buying life insurance, things like that. Um, you know, setting aside money, having a will, you know, all, all this stuff. So, um, oh yeah, it, 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 and that's actually talked about in the Bible as well. So it's not just Edgar, Edgar Casey. The spirit of rebellion is what uh, evil, the devil really is. Yeah, it's. I mean, you know, Lucifer is the the betrayer. Um, you know, so that that spirit of rebellion is. Yeah, definitely what we recognize as evil, turning away from what is good and, and choosing what we know to be wrong. Um, yeah, that's different than just making a mistake. Um, so. It, uh, let's see, here we there. Cain is outraged by his rejection. He confronts God, accuses him, and curses his creation. That proves to be a very poor decision. <laughs> Career-limiting move. God responds in no uncertain terms that the fault is all with Cain, and worse, that Cain has knowingly and creatively dallied with sin and reaped the consequences. That is not at all what Cain wanted to hear. It is by no means an apology on God's part. Instead, it's an insult added to injury. Cain, embittered to the core by God's response, plots revenge. He defies the creator audaciously. It's daring. Cain knows how to hurt. He's self-conscious after all, and has become even more so in his suffering and shame. So he murders Abel in cold blood. He kills his brother, his own ideal, as Abel is everything that Cain wishes to be. He commits this most terrible of crimes despite himself, all of mankind. And I'll add in um, Adam and Eve and God himself all at once. He does it to wreak havoc and gain his vengeance. He does it to register his fundamental opposition to existence, to protest the intolerable vagaries of being itself and Cain's children, the offspring, as it were, both in body and in his decision, are worse. In his existential fury, Cain kills once. Lamech, his descendant, goes much further. I have slain a man to my wounding, says Lamech, and a young man to my hurt. If Cain shall be avenged sevenfold, truly, Lamech, seventy and sevenfold. Genesis 4 through 423 and 24. Tublacane, an instructor of every every artificer in brass and iron, Genesis 422, is by tradition seven generations from Cain, the first creator, creator of the weapons of war. And next in the Genesis stories comes the flood. The juxtaposition is by no means accidental. Mary Lou, can I help you? No, okay. What are you looking for? Just my room. 
Oh, you you live next door. Do you want to go home? All right. Let me let Mary Lou go. And uh, I will goo goo some music in the interim. Meaning is what you have to buttress yourself against the tragedy of life. Despite the fact that you're a fragile, damaged, mortal creature, you found something to do that announced itself as worthwhile. That's me. It's an instinct. It's a deep, deep instinct. It's really the deepest instinct. It's like a form of vision. Meaning tells you when you're in the right place. And the right place is between chaos and order. And those are real places, your hemispheres. The right hemispheres roughly evolved, let's say, to deal with things you don't understand. That's chaos. And your left is there to deal with things you do understand. But you can't just stay with the things you do understand, because you already understand them. And you can't just stay with what you don't understand, because then you're lost. And you need to be in the middle of those two. And you can tell when you're in the middle, because everything lines up. Everything lines up. Expedience is you do the thing that gets you off the hook the fastest right now. You play that game across time, it doesn't work. It sends you down. Because you're sacrificing the future for the present. Meaning doesn't do that. Meaning says, I'm here where I should be. And you can't tell why. It's just that everything is right. You get this physiological sense. Right place, right time. Follow this meaningful path. That's your buttress against the tragedy that produces resentment and malevolence. Meaning is the antidote to that. That's the fundamental religious truth. Life is suffering. That's true. There's malevolence. That's true. Meaning is the antidote to that. Yes. People say, well, meaning isn't real. It's like, no, that's wrong. It's actually the most real thing. It might even be more real than suffering and evil. It's possible. This isn't a metaphysical assumption that I'm making. And you do feel it. It's, you feel it in your body. It's not just a, a mental thing. It's not an idea. It's a place. Because we're in time and space, right? And a place is a place. You know, three dimensions of space, but it's also a time. And when the place and the time are set up properly, you're in the right place. And your brain is telling you that. Your being is telling you that. The purpose of profound religious contemplation, profound philosophical contemplation, is to learn how to be in the right place at the right time, all the time. All the time. There's this line from the Gospel of Thomas, which was discovered in like 1957, and it says, the kingdom of God is spread out before the eyes of men, but men do not see it. And that's kind of what it's referring to. There are times when you're in the right place at the right time, and then you're where you should be, and you're not really trained to notice that, because it isn't something we ever talk about. It's like, you're in the right place at the right time. Okay, why? What did I do right? What did I do? I need to do more of that. So maybe it's only half an hour a week when you first start noticing. And then maybe with three months of practice, you can get it up to like an hour a day. And then maybe you can get it up to four hours a day. And God only knows where you could get it if you, if you keep practicing, you know. You, you, can, you can be there 
We don't know what Dr. Limit of that is. That is definitely one of my favorite songs by him. We don't know what the upper limit of that is. That, I mean, right place, right time. You know, if you're there all the time, what does that mean? You know, is, is that the story of Christ itself or himself? I should say it's, so, I don't know what his pronouns were. <laughs> so, all right, back to Cain. Um, evil enters the world with self-consciousness. The toil with which God curses Adam, that's bad enough. The trouble in childbirth with which Eve is burdened and her consequent dependence on her husband are no trivial, trivial matters either. They are indicative of this, of the implicit and oft agonizing tragedies of insufficiency, privation, brute necessity, and subjugation to illness and death that simultaneously define and plague existence. Bad pun. Their mere factual reality is sometimes sufficient to turn even a courageous person against life. It has been my experience, however, that human beings are strong enough to tolerate the implicit tragedies of being without faltering, without breaking, or worse, breaking bad. I have seen the evidence of this repeatedly in my private life, in my work as a professor, and in my role as a clinical practitioner. Earthquakes, floods, poverty, cancer. We're tough enough to take on all of that, but human evil adds a whole new dimension of misery to the world. It is for this reason the rise of self-consciousness and its attendant realization of mortality and knowledge of good and evil is presented in the early chapters of Genesis and in the vast tradition that surrounds them as a cataclysmic, as a cataclysm of cosmic magnitude. Conscious human malevolence can break the spirit, even tragedy could not shake. I remember discovering with her that one of my clients had been shocked into years of serious post-traumatic stress disorder, daily physical shaking and terror, and chronic nightly insomnia by the mere expression on her enraged, drunken boyfriend's face. His fallen countenance, Genesis 4-5, indicated his clear and conscious desire to do her harm. She was more naive than she should have been, and that predisposed her to the, to the trauma, but that's not the point. The voluntary evil we do to one another can be profoundly and permanently damaging even to the strong. I'll repeat that. The voluntary evil we do to one another can be profoundly and permanently damaging even to the strong. And what is it precisely that motivates such evil? It doesn't make itself manifest merely in consequence of the hard lot of light, life. It doesn't even emerge simply because of failure itself or because of the disappointment and bitterness that failure often and understandably engenders. But the hard lot of life magnified by the consequence of continually rejected sacrifices however poorly conceptualized, however half-heartedly executed. That will bend and twist people into truly monstrous forms who then begin consciously to work evil, who then begin to generate for themselves and others little besides pain and suffering, and who, who do it for the sake of that pain and suffering. In that manner, a truly vicious circle takes hold, begrudging sacrifice half-heartedly undertaken, rejection of that sacrifice by God or by the reality, take your pick, angry resentment generated by that rejection, descent into bitterness and the desire for revenge, sacrifice undertaken even more begrudgingly or refused altogether. And it's hell itself that serves as the destination place of that downward spiral. I was talking to somebody on TikTok today. Um, she had, uh, 
there was this Christian gal who who was trying to use, you know, the fear of hell. You you should, you know, not sin because you might end up going to hell and blah, blah, blah. And, and she was like, yeah, that, that's a great way to get people into Christianity through fear. And so she went off on this thing. And I was like, you know, human beings are perfectly capable of creating hell on earth. Uh, and she wholeheartedly agreed. And, you know, we talked about the, the different, um, you know, she was like, I know not all Christians are like that. And I was like, yeah, no, those kind of Christians piss me off. So <laughs> yeah, I'm right there with you. Uh, and it was really, really pleasant for, you know, cause she understood that I respected her path um, because she's not, she's, got a relationship with God, but it's not the traditional Christian relationship with God. Um, and I was like, oh yeah. You know, and, and I heard this um, from a Jesuit priest. He had given a commencement speech at one of the graduations at St. Louis University High School. Um, and uh, he said, you know, <laughs> he shocked the parents. He's like, we have taught you, you know, all types of different religion, all types of, of different um, philosophy. And we hope that you, we have armed you with enough knowledge that you can go out there and choose your own path. You know, they thought they were sending their kids to a good Catholic school to teach them how to be good Catholics. And Jesuits are not like that, you know. Uh, just look at the Jesuit Pope. So, you know, uh, yeah, it's not, Jesuits aren't all about Catholicism. They're all about Christianity, which is a big, big difference. Um, and his, his saying was, there's more than one way up the mountain. And I just thought that was so beautiful. Um, you know, you don't have to be the going on the perfect path and, you know, going to church every Sunday. You don't have to be that kind of Christian to be a good Christian. You don't have to be that kind of Christian to be able to reach God, uh, which is fantastic. Um, Latin Patriot says, uh, there are consequences of our actions and every interaction we have with someone is supposedly not by accident. And we will have a 360 panoramic two person point of view and how we affected others according to Dan and Brinkley, who claims to have died a few times. That is, I, I believe in that. Um, my grandmother died on the operating table, either that or they, put her into, you know, full shutdown for her heart surgery. And she could see the entire room. She could see the surgeon. She knew what they were saying and was able to report back after her surgery, what they had said. Um, and, you know, there are a number of, of stories like this um, where there is uh, after death consciousness. Um, and, and I believe not only do we, are we able to see, you know, what the effect we had on others and stuff like that. But it, it the effect that we had on ourselves. Um, so yeah, karma, karma means action. Exactly. Exactly. Um, and yeah, so all of these things, all of these spiritual things that, you know, whether it's Eastern, Western or anywhere in between are trying to figure these great mysteries out um, and the experiences that people have had and stuff like that. So yeah, just, whew, this is heavy stuff, folks. This is, this is not, you know, <laughs> um, Latin Patriot says uh, we will. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah. And that's, that's, you know, being able to forgive yourself. Hey, Anna's in the house. Good to see you. Um, there we go. See and know what our destiny was, what we were supposed to do, and what we did. Um, and then the afterlife. Exactly. So, I mean, and that's, they, they talk about that you know, a lot in Eastern traditions that when you die, you actually walk through you know, before you get to heaven, you have to walk through hell and the demons and face your demons um, before you're able to reach paradise. Uh, and I think that's kind of, I think it's true and not true because I think that there's an understanding that comes when we're no longer 
in these mortal coils um, that transcends what we can know here and now, and that it's a profound forgiveness of ourself, of our others, uh, you know, the, of life itself that sort of thing because when when you finally understand everything it's a it's the ultimate aha mo moment you know you get it and so yeah that's that's what i think happens but that's just me <laughs> repent and live better from the now yep yep um so Anna says, I just received Jordan Peterson's new book. Yes, we're going to, um, I'm thinking of doing that one next, uh, but I'm with you on this one. Yep. Oh, doggy. Not right now. Um, we still grow and learn spiritually in the afterlife, but we have the most opportunity to learn because of our free will when we have a physical body. Yep. Um, and it's, it, it's more like um, being in the movie than watching the movie. You know, when you're alive, you're in the movie. Um, and so, you know, actions have consequences and you can experiment and try things out and blah, 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 blah. Uh, whereas the afterlife is more like watching the movie. So, uh, all right. And then... Um, Where were we? Uh, life is indeed nasty, brutish, and short, as the English philosopher Thomas Hobbes so memorially, memorably remarked. But man's capacity for evil makes it worse. This means that the central problem of life, dealing with its brute facts, is not just what and how to sacrifice to diminish suffering, but what and how to sacrifice to diminish suffering and evil, the conscious and voluntary and vengeful source of the worst suffering. The story of Cain and Abel is one manifestation of the ar archetypical tale of hostile brothers, hero and adversary, the two elements of the individual human psyche, one aimed up at the good and the other down at hell itself. Abel is a hero and true, but a hero who is ultimately defeated by Cain. Abel could please God, a non-trivial and unlikely accomplishment, but he could not overcome human evil. Wow, that's a hell of a statement. He could please God, but not overcome human evil. That's... Uh -huh. For this reason, Abel is archetypically incomplete. Perhaps he was naive, although a vengeful brother can be inconceivably treacherous and subtle like the snake in Genesis 3.1 but excuses even reasons even understandable reasons don't matter not in the final analysis the problem of evil remained unsolved and even by the divinely even by the divinely acceptable sacrifices of evil it took thousands of additional years for humanity to come up with anything else resembling a solution the same issue emerges again in its culminating form in the story of Christ and his temptation by Satan. But this time it ex it's expressed more comprehensively and the hero wins. So, all right, it's uh, almost 6.30. So I'm going to um, do a smoke break um, oh, while well, I'm going to listen to this comment by or read this comment by uh, Latin first. Uh, I have heard the voice of God once when I was awake about seven, eight years ago, and all the masculine voice said to me, externally was, you need me, not them, for me to basically seek God instead, or God instead of the approval of my in-laws. Wow, that's cool. Um, I, I've, I've heard... I don't know if it was, oh, I don't know if it was the voice of God or uh, an angel of God, but I've had similar 
um, insights and things like that. Because there, there's, we were talking earlier, you weren't here for it, but we were talking earlier about that inner voice of conscience that says, do this, don't do that. Um, and if we follow it, you know, good things happen. If we don't follow it, bad things happen. Um, and, um, but I also think that the, um, the, that isn't necessarily the voice of God. It's the voice, it's the daughter of the voice, the bot Cole, um, that gives you intuition and insight and things like that. Um, I think that the actual voice of God, um, would be something, um, different, something more profound. Um, so that's, that's awesome that, that, that you had that experience. Um, you know, uh, uh, what, a, what a wonderful thing to be able to let go of the reactions of your in-laws, the approval of your in-laws, that kind of thing. Um, and to know where true goodness lies. So are the dogs going to settle down here? Yep. A beautiful message, a beautiful message. I, I wholeheartedly agree, Shaman. I wholeheartedly agree. So uh, we're going to take a smoke break now. Um, it looks like Mary Lou is not going to come back and I need to take some uh, medication. So I will be right back. Smoke them if you got them. And this time I'm not going to put music up. We're just going to take a five minute break. <laughs>
Anna says, when you come back, I don't mean to get you off topic. Hope you are doing well. I don't know if be I don't know if you would like donations, but I, yes, I would. Thank you very much. Um my let me get that up here. That's my Cash App. Um and uh I, I do appreciate the help. Um I've got my ketamine coming up and then I think that I will probably need groceries before, <laughs> and the ketamine costs $40 per session. That isn't covered by insurance. So I've got that expense coming up and I've got enough right now for it, but I don't have much beyond that. <laughs> so <laughs> thank you very much. I appreciate it. I appreciate it so much. You have, oh, excuse me. You have no idea. You have no idea. So from the bottom of my heart, from the bottom of my heart, you guys are, amazing i mean just the fact that you're willing to sit through a five minute you know dead silence <laughs> and come back and still hang in there i mean that just shows what troopers you guys are so uh bless your hearts so um but we have some other comments here um Latin Patriot says, thoughts sharing the message I received should not discourage others into feeling down and negative because I don't didn't want to hear from the spirit. Okay. Hopefully it's a simple message that helps someone knows that all we need to do is seek God first. That is a beautiful point. That is a beautiful, beautiful point. And um, yeah, no, I, I wholeheartedly agree. So uh, Shaman says, the universe is an interesting place. This I know. It is indeed open to all sentient beings. Yes, absolutely. Um, and uh, what a wonderful and magical place this is. You know, and magic isn't always good. You know, there's dark magic out there. So, but this place is, is absolutely magical. There's so much more than meets the eye. You know, so much of our interior world. I mean, we are worlds unto ourselves. I have a whole cast of characters up here. <laughs> you know, it's not just me. Um, and um, yeah, it's, it, it, life is a blessing and a curse. You know, we kind of curse ourselves sort of thing. I, just, I don't know. I don't know. It's, it's too much for me to understand. And I'm glad Jordan Peterson wrote this book. That's all I'm saying. So, all right. I will take that banner down because I'm embarrassed to ask for money. But I'm grateful all the same, but I, I feel bad at the same time. But I know it's because you guys love me. And so, yeah, I, it's, I'm very conflicted about all of this. But, yeah, if it's done voluntarily, um, yeah, I, I appreciate it greatly. So, all right. Uh, evil, comma, confronted. Boom, 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 boom. Jesus was led into the wilderness, according to the story, to be tempted by the devil, Matthew 4, 1, prior to his crucifixion. This is the story of Cain restated abstractly. Cain is neither content nor happy, as we have seen. He's working hard, or so he thinks. But God is not pleased. Meanwhile, Abel is, by all appearances, dancing his way through life. Uh, this is not true. Oh, and Abel wasn't raising crops. His crops flourish. Women love him. Worst of all, he's a genuinely good man. Everyone knows it. He deserves his good fortune. All the more reason to envy and hate him. Things do not progress well for Cain, by contrast, and he broods on his misfortune like a vulture on an egg. Now, I need to correct Jordan Peterson in this. Abel was sent out to look after the flocks. That's why he has meat to offer, not the grains of the city dweller, which is what Cain has. Um, Abel is out there with basically a slingshot, rocks, and his own wits to battle every predator that's out in the wilderness that wants to come after that flock. So, it's, you know, the whole story of um, leading me through the shadow, uh, the valley of the shadow of death. You know, and, and Jesus being the good shepherd is absolutely an allusion back to Abel. And 
isn't it interesting that, you know, to be able-bodied, you know, we could get into all sorts of things about wordplay on that. Um, and cane is, you know, what you use when you're crippled. So we know from the very start that you have the able-bodied one and the crippled one. Um, so th there are all sorts of ways to play with, I mean, the meaning that is in these stories is so profound. And, and what blows my mind, oh my gosh, is that the story of Cain and Abel is eight lines long. Eight lines. I mean, this isn't the rhyme of the ancient mariner, which goes on and on and on and on for pages. Eight lines and so much meaning is stuck in those eight lines. It's just, you know, how many people have played with the story of, I mean, look at, um, you know, Loki and Thor. Same thing. That's Cain and Abel. You know, there, there's so much richness in those eight lines that is just so profound. So... Uh, Samantha says, uh, agreed Latin without him. I could not dredge through the trenches with a smile. That's for sure. Amen to that sister. Amen to that. <laughs> oh my goodness. Yeah. Um, being on the front lines of chronic pain and chronic illness and stuff like that. It is, it is God that allows me to keep my good spirit. Uh, doesn't mean that I'm always in good spirits. But I don't stay in the negative stuff for long. Um, you know, I, I do get redeemed, as it were. So, all right. And that's the other thing about Cain. Cain lived in the city with all the comforts of the city and thought he was sacrificing, you know, with the hard toil that he did and, you know, the living according to city laws and, and, you know, being an upright citizen and all that stuff. Um, but that did not make God smile. That is appealing to man. That is not appealing to God. Facing danger, you know, with selflessness to protect some other living thing. That's what Abel did. That is what's pleasing to God. I tell you, I could talk about the Cain and Abel story for uh, two hours alone. So... Um, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. So, all right, let's get back into it. Jesus confronted in the wilderness. Uh, Cain, all right. <sighs> Cain strives in his misery to give birth to something hellish and in doing so enters the desert wilderness of his own mind. He obsesses over his ill fortune, his betrayal by God. And it wasn't a betrayal by God. It was just a put down. You know, it's not the only sacrifice that you're ever going to make in your life. You know, it's just that sacrifice. And you didn't measure up, kid. Get your SHIT together and, and realize what you're missing. You know, look to your brother and and talk to him and see what he did, what he had to do to earn the favor of God and then do that. But no, Cain doesn't want to do any of that. So he'd rather be jealous. Oh, oh and that just hit home. Oh, all right. So... Cain nourishes his resentment. He indulges in even more elaborate fantasies of revenge. And as he does so, his arrogance grows to Luciferian proportion. Quote, I am ill-used and oppressed, he thinks. No, he was the firstborn and the chosen one, and that's why he got to live in the city with all its safeness and comforts and being able to sleep under a roof and stuff like that, where Abel wasn't able to. Um... Uh, this is a stupid bloody planet. As far as I'm concerned, it can go to hell. And with that, Cain encounters Satan in the wilderness for all intents and purposes and falls prey to his temptations. And he does what he can to make things as bad as possible 
motivated by, in John Milton's imperishable words, so deep a malice to confound the race of mankind in one root and earth with hell to mingle and involve, done all to spite the great creator. Spite. Spite and malice. They, it's a card game I used to play called Spite and Malice, and it was vicious. Um, but yeah, to spite the creator, to say F you to God. Yeah, you, this is the one you like better? Yeah, screw you. There, there's your favorite son. It's no wonder the wrath of God came down on Cain. No wonder at all. <laughs> Cain turns to evil to obtain what good denied him. And he does it voluntarily, self-consciously, and with malice of forethought. I'll repeat that. Cain turns to evil to obtain what good denied him. And he does so voluntarily, self-consciously, and with malice of forethought. What do we call that? We call that murder one. You know, that's in our laws. Malice of forethought. You know, this, this wasn't a crime of passion. You thought this out. You knew what you were doing. And you did it anyway. Oh! So... Christ takes a different path. His sojourn into the desert is the dark night of the soul. Or if you want to quote Douglas Adams, the dark tea time of the soul. <laughs> a deeply human and universal human experience. It is the journey to the place each of us goes when all things fall apart. Friends and family are distant. Hopelessness and despair reign. And in black nihilism beckons. And let us suggest, in its testament to the exactitude of the story, 40 days and nights starving alone in the wilderness might take you exactly to that place. Side note, whenever in the Bible it says 40 days and 40 nights, that's a euphemism for we don't know how long it was, but it was a long time. Because the flood lasted for 40 days and 40 nights. It's, it's there equivalent to once upon a time, whether he slept for a day or a year, no one knows. That's what 40 means in Jewish texts. So it is in such a manner that the objective and subjective worlds come crashing synchronistically together. 40 is a deep symbolic period of time echoing the 40 years. The Israelis, that's another 40 the 40 years the Israel, Israelites spent wandering in the desert after escaping the tyranny of Pharaoh in Egypt. 40 days is a long time in the underworld of dark assumptions, confusion, and fear. Long enough to journey to the very center, which hell is itself. A journey there to see the signs can be undertaken by anyone, anyone that is, who is willing to take the evil of self and man with sufficient seriousness. A bit of familiarity with history can help. A sojourn through the totalitarian horrors of the 20th century with its concentration camps, forced labor, and murderous ideological pathologies is as good a place of any to start. That and some considerations of the fact that the worst of the concentration camps guards were human, all too human too, and the worst of the concentration camp guards, if you've read Viktor Frankl's uh, Man's Search for Meaning, they were other Jews. The Germans didn't have enough manpower to have concentration camp guards run everything. So they put other Jews in power in the concentration camp over other Jews. And Viktor Frankl says that they were some of the worst of the worst. If they didn't start out that way, they soon became that way. Same thing was said by Solzhenitsky 
Um, and, and Stalin did the same thing in the gulags, uh, where it was the other gulag inmates who were set up as foremen, and, um, it, just as a kind of expression of, of you know, similar status, foremen over the camps. Um, and they were some of the most vicious of the lot. You know, because they had all the resentment of being in the gulag, of being in the concentration camp and being a victim of the gulag and concentration camp, but having the power to then express that pain, that suffering, that resentment towards others, towards their own kind. So that goes back to the voluntary self-conscious and with malice of forethought. You know that they are fellow prisoners like you. Are you going to treat them nice? No, you're going to take out all your pain and suffering on them as well. Ouch. Um, that's part of making the desert story real again, part of updating it for the modern mind. After Auschwitz, said Theodore Adorno, student of authoritarianism, there should be no poetry. He was wrong, but the poetry should be about Auschwitz. In the grim wake of the last 10 decades of the previous millennium, the terrible destructiveness of man has become a problem whose seriousness self-evidently dwarfs even the problem of unredeemable suffering. And neither one of those problems is going to be solved in the absence of a solution to the other. This is where the idea of Christ taking on the sins of mankind as if they were his own becomes key, opening the door to understanding of the desert encounter with the devil himself. Homo sum humani nihil a me alenum puto, said the Roman playwright Terence. Nothing human is alien to me. No tree can grow to heaven, adds the ever-terrifying Carl Gustav Jung, psychoanalyst extraordinaire, unless its roots reach down to hell. I didn't know that was the full quote. No tree can grow to heaven unless its roots reach, excuse me, reach down to hell. Such a statement should give everyone who encounters it pause. There was no possibility for the movement upward, upward in that great psychiatrist's deeply considered opinion without a corresponding move down. It is for this reason that enlightenment is so rare. Who is willing to do that? Do you really want to meet who's in charge at the very bottom of the most wicked thoughts? What did Eric Harris, mass murderer of the Columbine High School, write so incomprehensibly the very day prior to massacring his classmates? Quote, it's interesting when I'm in my human form, knowing I'm going to die, everything has such a touch of triviality to it. When I'm in my human form. See, I was just going to say that to the, the previous thing. Uh, do you really want to meet who's in charge at the very bottom of the most wicked thoughts? And I thought, me, I am. You know, I will be the first to admit that I am at the bottom of those most wicked thoughts. That, that's me, right here, human being. You know, my heart reaches all the way to hell. I hope to God that means that, you know, <laughs> I also reach all the way to heaven. But, you know, that's that who's at who can be the most evil? Well, don't get me started because I'm a chronic pain patient. Let me know. I know how to torture people. I know how. To, I know. Because I've been through so much pain myself. You know. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, who would dare explain such a missive or worse, explain it away? Yeah, I'm not going to explain it away, but I, I can certainly explain it. You know, everything has a touch of the triviality to it. 
No, I, I, well, we got sirens. in which they they do their howls <laughs> so um uh, i love it when they do that it just it's yeah it's so cool it's so cool um everything has a touch of triviality to it triviality and also profoundness you know you can't just i mean yeah things don't matter when you're going to die but that also makes things more profound because what does matter you know what what is it that that has meaning you know knowing and that's the thing when i'm in my human form knowing i'm going to die yeah there's a thing in emdr uh which is eye movement desensitization reprocessing it's a type of therapy and HMOs loved it back when HMOs was a big thing because the more you did that therapy, the less of it you actually needed, uh, meaning that there was actually healing taking place. You know, you weren't just stuck in this pattern of, of going to session after session after session. Um, and uh, so um, in that therapy, I completely lost my train of thought. Oh, when I'm in my human form, um, that in order to create your healing area, you, um, <sighs> they had to get on the phone, right? <laughs> Shaman says so cute. Yeah, I, I think it's adorable too. Um, but in EMDR, you create these different archetypes. Uh, one is your protective self. One is your spiritual self. And one is your nurturing self. And it was my spiritual self that for me was not human. Um, when I visualized what that would be, it, it was almost a fractal of light with, you know, that would have rainbows that would shoot through it because of the way that it, it, the light would, you know, prismatize as this, and it, it was moving. It wasn't, it wasn't static, but it was like this, the diamond shaped light fractal with a, with a solid core at the center. Um, and that's what my spiritual self looked like. It, it didn't look human. So I can understand this feeling of when I'm in my human form. I can understand that completely. Um, so I, I would dare explain so, such a missive. Having been through the hell I've been through with the chronic pain, yes, I would. I would. I absolutely would explain it. I would not explain it away. Absolutely not. Um, you know, what, what happened to Columbine was horrific. And I still remember that day and where I was and what was going on and what I was doing. Um, so <sighs> in the desert, Christ encounters Satan. See Luke 4, 1 through 13 and Matthew 4, 1 through 11. This story has clear psychological meaning, a metaphorical meaning, in addition to whatever else material and metaphysical alike it might signify. And it means that Christ is forever he who determines to take personal responsibility for the full depth of human depravity. It means that Christ is eternally he who is willing to confront and deeply consider the risks and temptations posed by the most malevolent elements of the human race. 
It means that Christ is always he who is willing to confront evil consciously, fully, and voluntarily in the form that dwelt simultaneously within him and in the world. This is nothing merely abstract, although it is abstract, nothing to be brushed over. It is no merely intellectual matter. Soldiers who develop post-traumatic stress disorder frequently develop it, not because of something they saw, but because of something they did. There are many demons, so to speak, on the battlefield. Involvement in warfare is something that can open a gateway to hell. Now and then something climbs through and possesses some naive farm boy from Iowa, and he turns monstrous. He does something terrible. He rapes and kills the women and massacres the infants of my lie, and he watches himself do it, and some dark part of him enjoys it. And that is the part that is most unforgivable. And later he will not know how to reconcile himself with the reality about himself and the world that was then revealed. And no wonder. In the great and fundamental myths of ancient Egypt, the god Horus, often regarded as a precursor to Christ, historically and conceptually speaking, experienced the same thing when he confronted his evil uncle Set, usurper of the throne of Osiris, Horus's father. Horus, the all-seeing Egyptian falcon god, the Egyptian eye supreme, eternal attention itself, has the courage to contend with Set's true nature, meeting him in direct combat. In the struggle with his dread uncle, however, his consciousness is damaged. He loses an eye. This is despite his godly stature and his unparalleled capacity for vision. What would a mere man lose who attempted the same thing? But perhaps he might gain in internal visions and undertakings something proportional to what he loses in perception of the outside world. That also um, is reflected in the story about uh, Odin, the one-eyed god. He hangs himself upside down on the tree of fate and sacrifices his eye. So he's got, he's the, uh, and it's that sacrifice of a piece of himself that gives him the supernatural vision. You know, the physical vision is gone and the supernatural vision comes in. Um, so these, these things are repeated in myths throughout the world. So um, let me get to the comments here that I've been missing. Uh, to say F you to God is very selfish and childish. Yes, absolutely. I completely agree. Uh, I was that way as a four to six year old. Well, yeah, you were four to six. But by acknowledging God, there was an accountability I was aware of. There are those that reject God because they don't want to be held accountable for their evil and selfish sins and actions against humanity. <clears throat> well, that's what we're talking about here. Is, you know, the, and, and Akira, the Don pointed that out in his song on this rule. Um, you know, you're sacrificing the future for the present. Um you know, it's, it's, you don't want to be held accountable. The consequences are the future. Um, and, you know, you want to be able to get your whatever right now. So that's, you know, expedience over sacrifice. So, um, yeah, the Jewish guards had to prove themselves worthy to the Nazis to stay out of the prisons. Exactly. So usually those Jews were doing worse atrocities than what the Germans would do. You want to impress the Germans, you'd be worse than the Germans. And so that's what happened in the camps. Um, just uh, I mean, break your heart stuff, break your heart stuff. And the, the amazing thing I think is that Victor Frankl only alludes to this, um, you know, and he says that, you know, this is something that happened. Eli Wiesel, who wrote Night, 
who talked about, you know, the kids having sex in the train cars as they're heading towards Auschwitz. You know, they left that chapter out in the book. I want an unabridged version. Um, but Eli Weisel's Night, and where he talks about all this stuff and what happened, um, he doesn't mention that at all. And I think it's a, a, a feeling of guilt, a feeling of knowing that that could have been him if he were offered such a position, that sort of thing. Um, because few people are willing to admit that stuff that, you know, but for the grace of God, there go I. Um, because it takes a hell of a lot of courage to say I'm just as flawed as this person who's persecuting me. And what can I say? So... Satan embodies the refusal of sacrifice. He is arrogance incarnate, spite, deceit, and cruel, conscious malevolence. He is pure hatred of man, God, and being. He will not humble himself, even when he knows full well that he should. Furthermore, he knows exactly what he is doing, obsessed with the desire for destruction, and he does it deliberately, thoughtfully, and completely. It has to be him, therefore, the very archetype of, archetype of evil who confronts and, temp, and, and tempts Christ, the archetype of good. It must be him who offers the savior of mankind under the most trying conditions what all men ardently desire. Satan first tempts the starving Christ to quell his hunger by transforming the desert rocks into bread. Then he suggests that he throw himself off a cliff, calling to God and the angels to break his fall. Christ responds to the first temptation by saying, one does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. What does this answer mean? It means that even under the conditions of extreme privation, there are more important things to food than food. To put it another way, bread is of little use to the man who has betrayed his soul, even if he was currently starving. And there's a footnote here. Okay, that's nothing. Um, Christ could clearly use his near infinite power, as Satan indicates, to gain bread now, to break his fast, even as in the broader sense to gain wealth, the world which would theoretically solve all the problems of bread more permanently. But at what cost? And to what gain? Gluttony in the midst of moral desolation? That's the poorest and most miserable of feasts. Christ aims, therefore, at something higher, at the description of a mode of being that would finally and forever solve the problem of hunger. If we all chose instead of expedience to dine on the word of God, that would require each and every person to live and produce and sacrifice and speak and share in a manner that would per permanently render the privation of hunger as a thing of the past. And that's how the problem of hunger in the privations of the desert is most fully and finally addressed. Oh. <sighs> there are other indications of this in the Gospels in dramatic and enacted form. Christ is continually portrayed as the purveyor of endless sustenance. He miraculously multiplies bread and fish. He turns water into wine. What does this mean? It's a call to the pursuit of higher meaning as the mode of living that is simultaneously most practical and of its highest quality. All right, now I'm going to stop there to talk about these two stories. Uh, the water and the want into wine is when the uh, host who's holding a wedding feast has held back his most pre precious vintage um, because they say that it's it's the best wine of the evening that they're tasting uh, when Jesus turns the water into wine and he doesn't really turn water into wine so much as he says, hey, you know those water jugs right there? Because 
what it is is they would have foot washing stations and they, they have these giant things of water, you know, draw water from the well, fill this up. Well, wine, when it was made, was not, it was made at a concentrated strength and you usually mixed it with water to make it actual drinkable wine. Otherwise it was, you know, more like a syrup. So Jesus says, you know, go draw water from the well, fill up these jugs, these jugs specifically, the ones that were, you know, supposed to be filled with water themselves for the washing of the feet, and then draw from that and give the party goers that wine. That way you won't run out of wine. Why? Because Jesus knows that the host has tried to hide his best wine in those water jugs. And so that's how that story can be made sense of. It's, it's, it's a story of selfishness where the host, who is supposed to be the most generous at that moment, offering his best for, for the, the blessing, doesn't do it. And Jesus, you know, basically shows him up. Well, but in the story of the fish and, and loaves, it's the child that comes forth and says, this is all I have. Disperse it among the crowd and feed them. And people in the crowd had probably been holding back. You know, they probably had snuck in, you know, like people will sneak food into the movie theater. People will sneak booze into the bar, that sort of thing. So they don't have to pay. Um, and, you know, as this child, this, this young, innocent child sacrifices everything he has for the masses, the masses feel guilty. And when the plates are dispersed around, they, they put whatever leftover they don't need in the plate. And that's how they were able to feed the multitudes and have so much more leftover. You know, and it's, it's, it's stories of fear, greed sacrifice i mean all of those things you know but the two stories are kind of antithesis to one another so um yeah i think that's just so cool uh let me get a little more ways into this before because we're about 15 minutes out so if you guys have any questions or, or comments or anything like that make sure to stick them in the chat so um What does, it, what does turning water into wine and uh, miraculously multiplies bread and fish, what does this mean? It's a call to the pursuit of higher meaning as the mode of living that is simultaneously most practical and of highest quality. It's a call portrayed in dramatic literary form. Live as the archetypical savior lives and you and those around you will hunger no more. The benefits of of the world manifests itself to those who live properly. That is better than bread. That's better than the money that will buy bread. Thus, Christ, the symbolic perfect individual, overcomes the first temptation. Two more to follow. Um, so he's got a footnote here. For anyone who thinks that this is somehow unrealistic, I give the concrete material reality and genuine suffering that is associated with privation. I would once again recommend Solzhenitsky's Gulag Archipelago, which contains a series of exceptionally profound discussions about the proper ethical behavior and its exaggerated rather than diminished importance in situations of extreme want and suffering. Yes, yes. And a thousand times yes. Um, Throw yourself off that cliff, Satan says, offering the next temptation. If God exists, he will surely save you. If you are in fact his son, God will surely save you. Why would God not make himself manifest to rescue his only begotten child from hunger and isolation and the presence of great evil? But that except establishes no pattern for life. It doesn't even work in literature. The deus ex machina, the emergence of a divine force that magically rescues the hero from a predicament, is the cheapest trick hack in the writer's playbook. It makes a mockery of independence and courage and destiny and free will and responsibility. Furthermore, God is in no way, is 
in no wise a safety net. No wise? No ways a safety net for the blind. He's not someone to be commanded to perform magical tricks or forced into self-revelation, not even by his own son. Not even by his own son. Wow. Do not put your Lord, your God, to the test. Matthew 4, 7. This answer, though rather brief, dispenses with the second temptation of Christ, does not casually order or even dare to ask God to intervene on his behalf. Don't play in traffic, kids. <coughs> he refuses to dispense with his responsibility for the events of his own life. He refuses to demand God prove his presence. He refuses as well to solve the problems of mortal vulnerability in a merely personal matter by compelling God to save him because that would not solve the problem for everyone else for all time. There is also the echo of the rejection of the comforts of insanity in this forgotten temptation. Easy but psychotic self-identification as the mere magical Messiah might well have been a genuine temptation under the harsh conditions of Christ's sojourn into the desert. Instead, he rejects the ideas that salvation, or even survival in the short term, depends on narcissistic displays of superiority and the commanding of God, even by his own son. Finally comes the third temptation. The most compelling of all, Christ sees the kingdoms of the world laid before him for the taking. That's the siren's call of earthly power, the opportunity to control and order everyone and everything. Christ has offered the pinnacle of do the dominance hierarchy, the animalistic desire of every naked ape, the obedience of all, the most wondrous of estates, the power to build and increase, the possibility of unlimited sensual gratification. That's expedience writ large. But that's not all. Such expansion of status also provides unlimited opportunity for the inner darkness to reveal itself. Lust for blood, rape, and destruction is very much part of power's attraction. It, not, it is not only that men desire power so that they will no longer suffer. It is not only that they desire power so that they can overcome subjugation and want, disease, and death. Power also means the capacity to take vengeance, to ensure submission, and crush enemies. Grant Cain enough power, and he will not only kill Abel, he will torture him first, imaginatively and endlessly, and then, and only then will he kill him. He will then come after everyone else. There's something even above even the pinnacle of the highest dominance hierarchies access to which should not be sacrificed for mere proximal success. It's a real place too, although not to be conceptualized in the standards of geographical sense of a place we typically use to orient ourselves. I had a vision once of an immediate landscape spread out for miles on, out to the horizon before me. I was high in the air and granted a bird's eye view. Everywhere I could see Great stratified multi-storied pyramids of glass, some small, some large, some overlapping, some separate, all akin to modern skyscrapers, all full of people striving to reach each pyramid's very pinnacle. But there was something above that pinnacle, a dominance outside of each pyramid in which all were nested. That was the privileged position of the eye that could or perhaps chose to soar freely above the fray that chose not to dominate any specific group or to cause, but instead to somehow simultaneously transcend all. That was attention itself, pull, pure and untrammeled, detached, alert, watchful attention, waiting to act when the time was right and the place had been established. As the Tao Te Ching has it, he who contrives defeats his purpose, and he who is grasping loses. The sage does not contrive to win, and therefore is not defeated. He is not grasping, so he does not lose. 
Um, <laughs> no worries if you're jumping back and forth, Samantha. I appreciate it. So we are at 720. We're almost to the end of this uh, section, so I'll just finish it up here. There is a powerful call to being in the story of the third temptation, to obtain the greatest possible prize, the establishment of the kingdom of God on earth, the resurrection of paradise. The individual must conduct his or her life in a manner that requires the rejection of immediate gratification of natural and perverse desires alike, no matter how powerfully and convincingly and realistically those are offered and dispense as well with the temptations of evil. Evil amplifies the, catastro the catastrophe of life, increasing dramatically this motivation for expedience already there because of the essential tragedy of being. Sacrifice of the more prosaic sort can keep that tragedy at bay more or less successfully, but it takes a special kind of sacrifice to defeat evil. It is the description of that special sacrifice that has preoccupied the Christian and more than Christian imagination for centuries. Why has it not had the desired effect? Why do we remain unconvinced that there is no better plan than lifting our eyes skyward, aiming at God and sacrificing everything to that ambition? Have we merely failed to understand or have we fallen willfully or otherwise off the path? I don't know. I think this is a much more peaceful world that we have now than we've ever had throughout time. Oh, all right. Maybe, maybe not the last 90 days, you know, <laughs> but that aside, you know, e even with the chaos of the pandemic and everything else, you know, 2020 was extremely peaceful. It, it was the year of peace deals in an area that had been at war for millennia. I mean, come on. So, you know, that that is, I think, evidence that even though we are, are flawed and, you know, tempted beings whose hearts reach all the way to hell, even as we reach towards heaven, I think that that is, you know, that we are improving. Uh, you know, we've, we've lifted more people out of poverty in the last decade than, than any other decade before, that sort of thing. So I completely understand, you know, um, the, the idea that, you know, yes, we are progressing. We are, as we cast our eyes skyward, things get better. The more we cast our eyes around the world itself and, and its material gains and things like that, the more suffering we create. The more we try to avoid suffering, the more suffering we create. It's the monkey's paw thing. The, the, you know, we need to make the sacrifice of that goodie that's in the jar in order to be able to save our life, which is much more valuable than whatever the hell is in that jar. But a monkey can't think that way. A raccoon can't think that way. So, um, yeah. Ah, oh, this was a good night. <laughs> uh, what's everybody's thoughts on this? I mean, I'm just, you know, just absolutely blown away by this chapter. And, and it's no reason... Yeah, no, no odd coincidence that this is my my favorite song by Akira the Dawn too. You know, um, and I just the the music that he put to that is just so pulling. You know, it it it's it's um, it's a call to triumph. You know, it's it's not a dirge or anything like that. Which, which you might think by all the things that we've talked about in this chapter, you know, all the darkness, all the evil, all the temptation, everything else, you would think that, you know, um, when turned into music, that wouldn't be necessarily such a happy thing. But it is. It is because there's a way out. There's a way through. Um, yeah, it's, it's just mind-blowing to me. It's just absolutely mind-blowing to me, you know. 
Uh, one of my favorite combinations of sayings is um, the key to walking through hell is don't stop and don't leave five minutes before the miracle. You know, and, and we don't know when that five minutes is ever going to be. So you got to keep going and you got to hang in there until you see that miracle. Um, and that's been so true for my life. And I, and I don't know if it's true for you guys as well, but I assume it is, you know, um, cause that's one thing I know about the Pam fam is that y'all are a bunch of people who have walked through hell maybe several times. So, you know, it's, it's one of those things that, yeah, we, we hang in there for a reason. Um, and, and we have a tenacity that is seen in few other places. So anyway, <sighs> yeah, good stuff tonight. Good stuff tonight. I really liked it. So anybody else? Do we have any comments, questions? We're shutting it down in four minutes. Well, four minutes and 42 seconds, because I'm going to replay this song for you all. I, I, if that's all right by you guys, you can hear the, the happy tunes. Um, although I don't want to overplay it at the same time, but I want to play it again. Oh, I love this song. Um, I'm going through hell. No use. Yeah, I'm going through hell. No sense in stopping now. Why stop and live in hell? Precisely. Precisely. That's it. If you stop in hell, you stay in hell. The key to walking through hell is don't stop. Don't stop. Don't stop believing. I mean, you don't even have to believe. You just have to have the tenacity. You don't even need hope. You just have the tenacity. You have to have the tenacity to put one foot in front of the other. You know, just do that. Just put one foot in front of the other. That's all you need. Just keep going. Keep going. You know, that's the point. That's the point. So, yeah, don't stop in hell and don't make hell worse. Because <laughs> we are creative creatures who can definitely make any horrible hellish situation worse. Um, but, um, yeah, it's been a good night. I'm glad to get back with you all. I'm glad that the Internet problems have been solved. I'm glad that the health problems have been solved. Um, I'm sorry. I may miss you next Thursday. It depends on how I react to the ketamine. I may come up anyway because just to document what a ketamine, the after effects of a ketamine treatment look like on day four, because it's going to be the fourth day. Um, I get four in infusions starting on Monday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Um, so I don't, I don't know what I'll be like on the other side of that. So I, I may do the live. I may not. It depends. It depends. I don't, I don't want to make an ass out of myself. I don't want to make, you know, I don't want to disrespect you guys by coming up here and making an ass of myself. So, but anyway, the dark shaman says the dark night of the soul is traveled to truly learn the light. Yes. And I'll add a sting quote to that one. Um, at night, a candle's brighter than the sun. He's actually quoting Shakespeare, but yeah. Shaman says, great show again tonight, Pam. Thank you so much. You are very, very welcome. Thank you all for being here. I love you all. My lovely Pam fam. You guys are so good to me. Um, just by being here it makes me so happy. This is, this is where my heart lies. So, but anyway, with that, um, we will uh, shut her down and uh, I hope you guys have a good night and Sunday at five o'clock uh, we will be doing the uh, Jordan Peters that I'm losing my words the Jordan Peterson biblical series again so um, yeah I'm looking forward to it I'll see y'all later good night <laughs>